quilt consultant at Historic Textile Studios in New Bern, North Carolina. She is the curator of the museum's much anticipated exhibit, Domestic Art, a display of quilts from the collection of the High Point Museum, which is on display, so please go by and see it if you haven't already. Today she will be sharing recommendations on how to preserve quilts and some background on how she became a quilt consultant. Welcome. Thank you. I love High Point Museum, <laughs> so I am absolutely honored to be here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, they have been just absolutely incredible to work with. They have a beautiful collection, and I got to see all of it pre-COVID. <laughs> I came and spent time, and we just went through and looked at everything and identified everything, and so it was it was just lots of fun. And now this wonderful exhibit they put together has culminated what work that was done. And I think the one of the best things about this exhibit is they're going to be rotating things out. So, so many times you see an exhibit, that's it. If you come back six months later, you're going to see the same thing. It's probably fun and you'll see something new every time. But with them, they're going to rotate the things out, which I think is just terrific. And uh, so definitely, you know, keep coming. Don't just say, all right, I've already been. And tell your neighbors, you know, tell your neighbors, tell your church friends, your quilt guild friends, whoever. Um, we were talking about it, but, you know, local people so oftentimes, they just take for granted these gems that we have in our communities. I live in New Hebron, where Tron Palace is, and my husband, is a Civil War antique dealer. He sells things to Tron House, but he's never even been there. Oh. You know, <laughs> I said, well, come on, you know, this is ridiculous. <laughs> so uh, people need to appreciate that. So I'm going to take y'all on whirlwind. And they have given me fabulous, fabulous handouts, or if you don't have them now, you will be getting them before you get out. <laughs> There'll be a lot of things in those handouts you'll think, she didn't tell us that. Mm -hmm. No, I normally, what I'm gonna tell you today, I usually do in at least a two or three, three hour workshops. So just, you know, hold on to your seat and you will get a chance at the end to ask some questions. And, um, or later this afternoon, if you have questions and you wanna ask me, grab me. Uh, I love to talk, I love to share information. And so I would love to help out. I've been a textile conservator since I started out in about 1991 because of my husband being a Civil War person. We were opening a Civil War museum in Newburn. He was paying a textile conservator out of the D.C. area a bunch of money to do flags and uniforms. I was a textile major until they told me all I could do with that was be a buyer for belts. <laughs> and I said, I don't want to do that. I just don't want to work weekends and all that. And I said, so I ended up going into education. Well, I found out I did early childhood education because I worked at camps, loved little children. But I now laugh and tell everybody, uh, this is one of my favorite lines, that I found out I love to teach as long as your mama didn't make you come today. So nobody's mama forced you, right? <laughs> uh, so, you know, I love willing learners. So that is kind of, so then I ended up doing lots and lots of different things. So, but with the textile conservation, Will said, you need to learn this. So I started taking workshops all over the United States. In the summers, we would go and spend a whole week, rent out a whole top level of a bed and breakfast or whatever. And he was a great daddy, and he would take the children on adventures. They would go dig for fossils, you know, they'd do all sorts of things. And I would take classes. So I did that in many locations across the United States. And between that and the Civil War shows that we take the kids to, uh, we have ended up, we finally made the goal to take our children to all 50 states, and we did it. Hmm. So, uh, and my children said it's one of the best things we did for them. So that was pretty exciting to it. Do they love Civil War parts? No. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I understand that. So we will start with this. Uh, you know, I could talk and talk about those things, but we need to get on with, with conserving quilts. So I will, why did I choose this particular block? 
is you'll see with this block, look, it's got, let me make sure I get this right. Look at that little pie piece out of there. You know, that woman was so annoyed because when she made that quilt, all of it was brown. When it was washed, she had done two different dye lots, didn't realize it, and probably the lye soap she used to wash it in removed a lot of that brown. So we will see some of those kinds of things. So just, um, that's a good way to start. So all, all quilts teach, in my opinion, but not all are perfect. And I do not have a perfect collection. I probably own over 200 quilts, but they all, a lot of them have issues because I would rather buy 10 teaching quilts than one fabulous quilt that I can't take or show to people. I want to be able to show. So this is uh, was done in my studio when um, the quiltshow.com came to visit. So these are kind of boring slides here, but uh, we'll get to lots of pictures in a minute. So we, I've given you an, an, a sheet on uh, how to take care of your quilts and how do you know should I do anything to it? Any of you have a quilt that needs fixings, has issues, problems? Just one, two, three, four. Okay, all right. We need to know. We need to know. You know. Do you leave it alone? And just as a friend of mine has made very famous in our quilt group, you look at it and you think it needs washing. Oh, I think I need to go lay down and take a nap. <laughs> and it's, you wake up and you go, you know what? It looks good. So what is an antique quilt? What's a vintage quilt? Well, <laughs> antiques are supposed to be 100 years old. Vintage is more, you know, in that time period of 20 past. Um, I'm becoming more and more of an antique. Uh, we all are. So it's funny, you know, you go out shopping and you see things that you grew up with as a kid and they're calling it antiques and you're going, no, it's it not, you know. It can't be, but no, it's definitely vintage. So, um, you know, how do you take care of it? You know, look at the types of damage, the cleaning, the display, and the restoration. So we're going to talk about that. And not all quilts are equal. This quilt actually is a quilt that we own, and it belonged to Winston Churchill's great-grandmother, uh, Jer Jer Jenny Jerome, I think Jenny Jerome's mother, uh, who lived in New York. We have a little tag on it and everything that tells us that. So yeah, this is a pretty special, spectacular quilt. It's called a palimpore. That's my um, email address, palimpore at aol.com, because I've been studying these for many years. So how are they different? You know, some quilts, this one um, that shows, that's here, whoops, I'm sorry, the back. Uh, this one here is a very important Quilt. It's a North Carolina quilt, and it shows you how the um, mid mid um, United States, Maryland, that area, influenced quilt making in North Carolina. It's a very fancy quilt, very well done, and it had provenance that it was made in the Kenansville area. Now the other quilt is pretty cool. I love this pattern. It's an oak reel but it's in pretty bad condition. And I mean, look at that border. Would I restore that? No. But I also would like to be able to use it in classes and things to show people because it tells a lot. It combines a lot of New England uh, influences, but it also has some things that says, hmm, New England, but I might have made, been made in North Carolina or the South. So we see a lot of regional differences, which is lots of fun. So when you're looking at a quilt, quilt, what's restoration and what's conservation? Yeah, what are those words? What do they mean? Uh, conservation means that you worry more about the environment. You know, is it it's stored in a basement? Is it stored in an attic? Or is it stored in the area where you live? Uh, go for the area where you live, uh, you know, in, and also the biggest thing is we'll talk about are lights, you know, be careful with those, with the lighting. 
Um, you know, and how do you clean it? And the conservation, yes, you can clean it, but you have to be very careful. How do you display it? You know, that's one thing with the exhibit. And here they've been very careful about where they display things. They have all of those blocks on that back wall because that's where they've got light coming in more from those windows. So you consider, as I said, the light, the temperature, the humidity. Boy, in the South, humidity is a big deal. And uh, insects and then all the dust. So, you know, you might have a quilt that it's not filthy, but it might be dusty. And with that, you would take screening, like window screen, cover the edges with um, duct tape or something, lay it on top. And then I've got a, a little red devil back that has high and low, mm -hmm. and I love that. So on the low, you can cover up the, the hose thing with a piece of cloth and a rubber band to hold it on, and then vacuum it and just vacuum the whole quilt. And you'll be amazed at how much will come off. And that really helps it. So with your storage, no extreme damages. Uh, if you parch peanuts, uh, if there's a quilt that is in an attic for a long time, a lot of times it'll turn kind of that brown, a parched peanut. Because you know, you parch peanuts about 200, and these quilts in those attics in North Carolina some are about 200 probably. So it will deteriorate the textile and darken it, kind of cook it. So be careful with your storage containers. I'm sure all of you are thinking, hmm, is plastic okay? Well, plastic is okay in some cases. If you're storing them in bins or other things of plastic, wrap them in white cotton sheets or unbleached muslin and just don't have them up against the plastic. Um, so that's one thing. And um, with folding, be careful with that. I tell people, you know, we just had daylight savings time change. It's nice if you could fold, refold your quilts every time daylight ch savings changes to keep from having the same folds every time. I call it crazy thirds uh, or crazy fourths, you know, because if you do it half, half every time, you will see quilts. I've got this brown quilt over here. You've got super damage all the way down that middle, all the way there, because it was folded over and over and over. So there's what I said. You can use acid-free paper. It's not totally necessary, but it's good, but muslin's also good. Now, if you're cleaning it, you know, I'm um, talking a little bit more in, well, I'm talking about the vacuum, and I'm talking about you know, putting it outside and letting it air, or you're going to wash it. You know, look at the stability of the quilt. Is it really going to hold up? This one at the very end, I really have got to wash it. It just smells bad. And I've aired it out. It still smells bad. But there are some areas that I think if I did wash it, even in a big tank or something, it might start coming apart. So what I'll do with that is I will stitch uh, tulle. The, you know, I'll just do tulle over it and those damaged areas and make sure that those areas stay really nice and, you know, sturdy. You can do some across, across, you know, just make sure it does that. I do Civil War uniforms and I worked on a Civil War uniform that I covered the entire uniform in tulle to make sure that when I was moving it, because if something is wet, it gets much heavier. So that's when you do, and if you've got kind of rotten threads, that's when they start popping away. So you can use a little clothes brush, you know, those red things. You know, in some cases you can use those and they do a good job and you'll get up all sorts of things you didn't realize you had. But don't wash it in the washing machine. I had a woman, and I've got, I've got can't tell you all the tales I want to because I would be here a long time. Uh, but I had a woman call me recently, and she said, "What I, I um, you know, that piece of silk you told me uh, that you and I talked about about six months ago." I said, "Yes." She said, um, "And you told me that you couldn't help me right then, but she she said, but you said it would be okay to wash it in the washing machine.' But I did, but it really messed it up." And I said to her, "I said, ma'am." 
I don't mean to be disrespectful. I did not tell you to put that in the washing machine. And she said, well, I put it in the pillowcase. I said, ma'am, you still shouldn't have done that. And she brought it to me and I could have cried. But I was kind and gracious to her and I kind of patted her on the hand and I said, we'll work on it. So it was something her daddy had gotten in World War II, but don't, you know, unless it is, you know, 20th century, really, really super shape, you know, don't do that. And uh, don't dry clean. Dry clean dry clean's a misnomer. It means they are using chemicals. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I rarely, rarely dry clean anything. I did uh, do some um, Coast Guard uniforms that were from the 50s and 60s that were wool. I have done that for dry cleaning. Otherwise, I've never done anything for dry cleaning in the 30 years. And if you really don't know what to do, call, call me, you know, send me some pictures to my email address and say, this thing is filthy, what do I do? And I'll get on the phone and talk to you. So when you display, display in low light. You all kind of understand that. I'm not going to go into it a lot. And um, make sure it's supported well. So we, they have a quilt here that the back is very fragile. And it would be a beautiful quilt to hang. But, you know, you don't want to because you could end up with lots of damage. So they're folding it to display it. And uh, rotate the time to display it. And that's what they're doing here, which is perfect. I unfortunately decided that I was going to hang a quilt in my family room. It's a beautiful quilt, and I hung it for two years. I knew better, but I loved it. I was being lazy, and I kept looking at it thinking, it's good, it's good. Well, I took it down, and it was like, no, it is not good. You have, you know, really damaged this quilt. So um, I got used to it, and it just did it slowly, so be careful with that. Uh, if hanging on a wooden rod, you know, cover the rod with fabric. Uh, this over here, I actually have a sleeve that I pinned on it, but if I were going to hang it for a long time, I would have stitched that sleeve that I made. It's like a cloth tube, and just stitch it on in the back. And uh, any wood you're putting it on, make sure you kind of polyurethane it well, but also put a piece of cloth over it if you're not doing the tube. And watch your traffic. You know, that's one thing. You know, don't put it someplace that people are going to hit it with their watch in the ring every time they walk by. Now, is it rare or sentimental? Is it worth the time and the energy and the money? Um, will it require cleaning? And how will it be stored or displaced? And most of all, can you honor the quilt maker? You know, would that quilt maker come back um, to haunt you or love you? Mm -hmm. So I think that that's one thing you consider. And I will tell you very quickly, uh, I had a man come to me. He had his grandmother's, great-grandmother's quilt he had just found. It was from about 1900. It was in these colors on um, this on the table because that's about a 1900 quilt. But it was in raw, awful condition. Awful, awful, awful. And I said to him, I don't think you should, we should do anything with that. I said, look, you can fold it and it'll look really nice this way. Put it on the shelf, you're good. Oh, no, no, he wanted it, you know, he didn't want those torn places in it. He was a dentist, he had to fix everything. <laughs> and so I said to him, I don't think so. He said, how much is it worth? So I said, um, maybe $25? And he said, hmm. Well, now, how much are you going to charge me to do this? I said, well, I'm going to charge you at least $500. And I will only work on it when I have nothing else in the entire world to do. <laughs> you can tell I didn't want to do it. Because it was just, it was gone. It was gone. And that man said, well, then how much it will be worth? And I said, then it might be worth $50. <laughs> and he said, it wouldn't be worth at least $500. I said, nope, it's still an old ratty quilt that's falling apart. And I said, I know it's special to you. And I said, I appreciate that. And your grandmother would, great grandmother would be tickled to death. I said, but just look at it and enjoy it. Well, he was determined. So I said, okay. I was so mad at myself, I bet I made a dollar an hour on that part. Because I would stitch two seams and four would come out. The, it was rotten thread and it just kept popping and popping and popping and popping. 
and it would the fabric had been washed so much it would tear. So anyway, I learned a great lesson with that quilt. So there's sometimes you just honor that quilt maker by folding it on the shelf. So um, the restoration process. So who can move forward with it? You know, how are you going to do it? And what percentage needs to be done? A lot of times I will take safety pins and, you know, take a little piece of paper, um, usually paper towel because it's, it's not real you know, abrasive or anything, write a number on it and keep putting it on the places that are damaged. And if I end up with like 40 or 50 pieces, then I say to people, do you really want this done? But it could be a very historically significant quilt. And so then we'll say, yeah, we're going to work on it and see what we can do. And sometimes you do just put netting over it. Other times you try to find a textile that, that is compatible with the quilt. Um, so here, will it look like a chain fence around a log cabin? <laughs> you know, don't go down to Hobby Lobby and you got a quilt that was made in 1860 or 1880 and you go to Hobby Lobby, well that's pink fabric, so I'm just going to put some more pink. You know, this pink fell out, I'm going to put some more pink. Uh, no, don't do that. Uh, talk to me. Um, I've got a lot of fabric, I'll share. <laughs> so, um, and it once more is the quilt maker being honored and what is the fiber? I do textile analysis with um, microscopes to determine is it cotton, is it wool, is it um, linen. So the steps would be, isn't this a fabulous quilt? Yeah. This is made in Snow Hill, um, Green County area, Eastern North Carolina. It's owned by my friend Jan Willis. She met my son and she said, uh, I have a quilt that your mother might wants to steal from me. And I said, yeah, that's exactly it. I said, don't turn your head. So I do, I love this quilt. Very vibrant, very unusual. So, but if I were gonna restore this quilt, which it doesn't really need much, uh, I would measure it, I would photograph it, I would take notes, I would figure out what threads would be appropriate, what fabrics would be appropriate, decide if it needed cleaning, and then record the history. So I take a lot of notes, do a lot of work like that. Um, so, restoration projects, you say, it depends. You know, what's the fabric like? Can I find the fabric? Um, you know, is it a historic sentimental thing? Uh, I study these um, plaids, and I don't even have time to tell you about that, but I still study North Carolina produced plaids. And I have done this um, research since 1995. If any of you have a quilt that has any plaids that are similar to this, that look kind of like homespun, let me know, please, because I am I do lots of research on these. They started out being made in Alamance County, but then it spread across North Carolina, and North Carolina became one of the largest plaid producers by uh, the end of the 1800s. So um, this was these were family quilts. So yes, they were important. This was my great great granddaddy Jack's rocking chair and pictures of my family that I did a small exhibit. So, this is my studio. This is me working on a Civil War coat. Uh, I do a lot of work on Civil War Union and Confederate. And I do use a microscope, a bioscope and a regular microscope. Bioscope for determining the weave of the textile. Microscope more for the content. Now, this quilt over here I'm showing you, it had this big piece, the entire piece of fabric deteriorated. It was brown, there was some iron in it, and it obviously just fell apart every time it was washed. And I actually, it's been like this a long time, and yesterday I finally stitched that piece of fabric that's been pinned on it for 30 years. <laughs> so I'm very proud of myself. I've not quilted it yet. Now, how will I quilt it? I will quilt it only on the top, getting in the cotton, because I flipped it over, and you can see the quilting stitches on the back. So I don't want duplicate on the back. So that will be how that will be done. I'm not quite sure about that tear in the center, but that's where it was folded over and over and over. 
So what I do, this is the repair that began yesterday. I finally stitched it around the edges because I was able, I had a quilt that was completely falling apart and I took the back off of it. And this was one of those plaids. And I do the thread count by looking through a microscope at the uh, threads. Now, this is uh, a talk just a little bit about a project that I have done for um, the May Museum in Farmville. Please, go look at the PowerPoint that I have online. It is called The History and Preservation of the May Museum Quilt Collection. And if you just type in May Museum Quilt Collection, Farmville, North Carolina, it will come up. There are a couple of May museums, so make sure you put in Farmville. And I have done an entire um, PowerPoint for them years ago, and then I presented it in, in Charleston at an American Quilt Study Group um, conference. With that, it's phenomenal because they have so many quilts made by three women in their family. They're documented. But the interesting thing is they repeated patterns. They might have done a pattern in 1840, which you'll see in a minute, and then this one, they repeated it then in 1880. So they were repeating patterns, but with different fabric. But then also, you're able to see some of the fabrics that are in one quilt, they're in another quilt, another quilt. They were general store owners. So that's how they could have so much fabric to repeat. So this is the other, this is what they copied to do the other one. And it is assigned to Betha May. I thought it was Tabitha, but they corrected me. It's to Betha, and uh, 1842. So I did restoration work on this quilt because when I got it, it had a big fat mouse hole right there. Um, I mean, that map, it might have been a rat. I mean, it was that big. <laughs> and that's where your eyes went to immediately. But as you'll see, they used that same morning glory fab fabric over and over and over. And that was what I was repairing. It had a lot of that morning glory in it. I looked and looked and looked. Well, thank goodness, a company by the name of Spoonflower, started by NC State Textile students, was beginning to screen print textiles. And I sent them a photograph, whoops, of this, but I sent one that didn't have a ratty piece in it. And they were able to reproduce that fabric for me. So then, see there's the hole. Wow. And so I had a hard time matching white. Matching white is the devil because all whites are different, like blacks. So, and then I got my batting. So see, there you go with the with that, and I had to put a seam in it, so you'd think that was real, and I put it in there. See how it just fits right in? And I had, they were hanging it at the museum, and I, somebody said, I wanna see where it is, and I had to look and look and look, so I was so proud of myself. Mm -hmm. And then they had these reds that were really bad. Well, I knew that if you just put netting over that, it still would look bad, so I had to find a red, um, reproduction fabric. Fortunately, there are a lot of reproduction fabrics available. Now, for cleaning it, I did walk wet clean it after I did all the work. But I have actually just recently done a whole PowerPoint for a conference on the tangled web of cleaners because, oh my gosh, there are a bazillion of them. And nobody knows what they are because they are not forced to put the chemical content on these things. So, the question is, the pros, it removes abrasive, you know, abrasion, dirt, prolongs its life, maybe, and visual appeal. The cons is the weight of the water might damage it, dyes might run, dyes might fade, thread and fabric might be rotten, and chemicals might damage it. And it could be damaged by mildew and mold, banging my existence, living in eastern North Carolina uh, with hurricanes. Uh, so we won't even go there. That's a tough one. Dirt, grease, soot. I have actually uh, cleaned 
quilts that were in fires, and soot is greasy. So that's a tough one. Acid from wooden paper. Uh, put it, you know, everybody says, oh my gosh, I've got mine in my um, cedar trunk. And I'll say, do you have those quilts wrapped up? Because if you don't have them wrapped up in, probably in sheeting or something like that, you could have major damage on those folds from it being up against the wood. Or if you've got it tucked up in your closet, you can end up with some issues there. So be careful. Tide marks. These on this, um, this, I bet you've all seen those. And they are awful. And that's kind of an unknown stain. And so you, you're not exactly sure, you know, is it an acid, is it an oil, is it a, you know, what is it? So those are hard, it's hard for me to do tests on them. These um, tide marks mean that when it was wet, that it wasn't completely um, without dirt, and so the dirt molecules moved to the drier areas and took the dirt with them and that's what causes that. So if you learn nothing else today, you now know that. And so on um, wet cleaning, I have a big eight foot by 10 foot stainless steel tank that I wash in. So this is um, my helper, Teresa, who's no longer there and I miss her desperately. And so I've got this great big tank and I pour out the water, bring it back in, pour out the water, bring it back in and I do these little bottles to determine, you know, there, 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 and there. And then usually I'll finish a rinse up with white vinegar. Uh, mainly it will kind of take some of the sudsiness out. Uh, some, it used to be that people would say that it would stop it from bleeding. Chemically they have determined that is not true. I still wonder about it, so I try it. Uh, and it's not going to damage it because I keep rinsing, rinsing, rinsing. And this is my drying rack and I just put all sorts of bands all around it. And But I lay it face down. I put down sheeting, lay it face down, and put towels over it. Let it dry out a little bit. Those get kind of so soft and wet. Then you roll it and you put it back on. So I had to have somebody with me to do that because it's very heavy. Now, restoration of a family quilt. Determine the damage when they bring it in. Then we do a liability release because I say, you know what, this is an old textile. I'm gonna try my best to make sure it's okay. But if it completely falls apart, when you're determined it's gonna be washed, you know, it's don't come sue me. And I'll find the appropriate threads, materials, and you wet clean it, vacuum it, and label your quilt. You know, once it's all done, I have get, we're going to give you a sheet that tells you how to make labels. This is a wonderful quilt. Um, it was very damaged, and so this woman ended up uh, reproducing it, and it was lovely. Now, this is a quilt that I um, worked on for a lady in Zebulon. It was a family quilt, and it had lots of damage, but. She was very, very sentimental about it. The biggest, the parts that were the hardest were these wear spots, where they pulled it, you know, mm -hmm. pull it up to their neck, mm. you know, and who knows, I think that mouse got going at her house too. <laughs> so what I do over here is I took uh, clear vinyl and placed over it and drew out my pattern. Then I got my batting and put it in and then I put it underneath there, and then I stitched it in place. So, um, you can tell that I've done that. It's not, I did not try to fool you and tell you this never happened. You can see it up close because all restoration things like this should be reversible. You know, if somebody comes up with a better thing down the road, they can reverse it. But um, I thought that turned out pretty <coughs> daggone well, and uh, the entire quilt looks so much better. So now, how can damage occur? Where, like I said, pulling it up, there's a lot of damage right where people pull it up. In fact, 
Some of the quilts in Pennsylvania have what's called a beard guard, where men's dirty beards would be on that quilt, so they put a piece of fabric on it to protect it. Um, insects, you've got, you know, all sorts of insects that just love to, to party down with um, textiles. Then you've got rodents, you know, the nice things they have, you know, mice and rats, which I'm terrified of. And uh, then you've got dye that could break down the synthetic dyes that were created after the 1850, 1856 is when Perkins first found a mauveen, which was a purple, and then that's when the synthetic dyes took off. And by the turn of the century, there were a lot of synthetic dyes, but in the process, you had ended up with some real issues. And it can be damaged by fire. Charles B. Acock's workplace was um, caught on fire, and I did work on two of their fire uh, quilts. And that was a challenge. Flooding, that's a whole nother issue. So I went backwards, sorry. And this uh, brown quilt here is lovely. Unfortunately, all of those stripes are tears because the brown uh, dye has broken it down. So every time I move it, it tears some more. The only way I can deal with that is to put, I will eventually put netting over that and just to at least hold it in place. Now this other one over here is a real mystery. I mean, look at that. It just, that one few places, but then these browns just went crazy in there. I really can't tell you what happened. So with that one, I would just tell people, you know what, my hands don't look as good as they used to. <laughs> uh, I call it experience. So let's call this experience and leave it alone. Uh, silk crazy quilts. Anybody got a crazy quilt? Is it, is it messed up? Do you have any tears? You're lucky. Because there were irons in the mordants or other metallics. That it, that's a whole nother class. But anyway, they're metallics. They ended up breaking down these silks. Silks became extremely popular uh, after the 1880 World's Fair or 75 World's Fair in Chicago. And people just were making them. It's also a way of a woman saying, you know what? I have got some money now. I've probably got maids taking care of my house. And I don't have to be bothered with those cotton quilts. I can take time to make these fancy quilts. And usually they were not the size of a bed. They were more like a, a lap thing. Oh, let me say that. I'm, I left this one out. This is not a history lesson, but don't think that, don't believe this tale of they started quilting because they, in the early, early pioneer colonial days, because they didn't have any money and they cut up their fabric to turn it into quilts. That is a total myth. They did not. Um, it was wealthy people who started out quilting in Europe. And this was their way of showing they had money. A lot of times in their inventories, their textiles, their drapes, their, their coverlets, things like that were valued much more than their furniture. So um, it was really not until the early 1800s with the um, mechanization of the you know, spinny jenny, and then all of a sudden now you've got these big you know, manufacturing companies that are making textiles until that's when it got to the place that it became popular. And yes, a lot of women went out and bought that fabric to make sure their colors coordinated just like we do today. But there was a certain element that was using kind of what they could get. So you've got a mixture there. So if anybody says, oh yes, they, you know, that's not how it started. And, you know, sometimes those browns just completely go away. You know, it's been washed a few times and they're done. And so that's difficult. This is a case of, there really are some blocks. Just This block is very similar to that one on the right over there. But this just completely faded away <laughs> into nothing. Is that not amazing? So, and, and I don't even know what color it was. 
I could maybe open up a seam and look and find it under mag magnification or with a microscope, but that's the only way. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes those dots just, they were done, they were gone. But then over here, they're beautiful. And this is the exact same field. Now, this is an example of, can I use OxyClean and get everything real bright and white? Uh, I use OxyClean occasionally, but I use it very sparingly, and I only use it after I know a lot about the quilt. I've maybe already put it in um, Orbis quilt soap, or I have used all-free detergent, or something else that's very mild. And if I have got something that I know will hold up to a little bit of OxyClean, I'll do it. But I did this as an experiment because I have a lot of customers who say to me, ooh, I really hate that. Well, those are probably um, marks from wood. They're probably acid stains from the wood that it laid on. And these blocks are probably about 1840. And so one day I thought, you know what? I'm gonna see if I can get those little brown spots out. Well, I got them out pretty well, but I also, the yellow over dye that was on this to make it green, that's what it did, it made it green blue. Is that not a great example? Wow. So, uh, and this shows how with their printing textiles, a lot of times they would go over and over. They would dye it red, then they put in, then they would take chlorine and put the little splotches where they wanted to do their lines and flowers. And then they go over with a really dark brown and unfortunately, over time, that really dark brown would damage it enough that you end up with chunks of the fabrics dropping out. In fact, I have a lot of quilts that I say they look like they've got chicken pox because the flowers just fell out. You know, you still got pretty red around it because it's a, it's a, a turkey red, and turkey red is extremely, extremely um, secure, but the other stuff is not. So, see that brown? I mean, it just went. And this is an early quilt. This is probably about 1830, 1840, the chance that um, great, but that went. Now, this quilt is fascinating. This is a baby quilt, probably 1850, and I think that this had a signature in the middle. But over time, I think that the um, ink that they used ended up deteriorating and it was a baby quilt that was used and so they washed it and washed it and washed it but the other fabric held up really well isn't it beautiful so i reproduced it and this is a class that um i have never taught it and i really want to i've got it all set up to go um this is the antique quilt from the 1850s this is my quilt that i made to duplicate it and using reproduction fabrics. So I think that that shows that we can do those kinds of things, you know, and do a pretty good job. You know, I had to switch out a few things here. Um, my pink here, I ended up doing blue, but it still fits. Uh, I just, just didn't want to keep doing too many uh, of those. I wanted to show the different ones that would work. And kind of funny thing about it is that's the back of the quilt. So, uh, and this was, we think that this possibly was a fundra an abolitionist fundraiser quilt. We don't have exact knowledge of this, but Barbara Brackman says maybe it is. And we think that the women said, uh, come next week to help make these quilts and just bring some of your blocks you've been working on. And I think these were leftover blocks. I had one heck of a time, I never could find this. You think, you, it looks like, oh, that's orange gingham. No, it's a very different, it's more butterscotchy. So I put pink in it, because that would have been appropriate for that time period. But um, otherwise, I was really pleased with it. And I think that's a fun example of how that could be done. And it's a good way to honor it. So in the end, this is a palimbord. This is a quilt from probably about 1790. And look at what good condition it's in. So what you do is you say, what should I do to this quilt? And I always say, it depends. And maybe not take a nap, but maybe sit down with a 
glass of tea, and talk to your friends about it a little bit, and then call me if you need some help. So that is the end of the PowerPoint. Now, if y'all would like to ask some questions, I'm sure I left out a bunch, but I hope you you think you learned a lot too. Yes. I wrote my questions down. So Great. I don't forget. Um, I, in fear of being chastised, I'm going to just throw this out. Throw right it out there. Um, throw the quilt in the dryer on air and clean the dust. And, and it's not a 17 or 1800. Yeah, if it's if it's in decent shape, absolutely. I wet cleaned a quilt last week. And it was probably 1900-ish. It was not in fabulous condition. So I did, I wet cleaned it. I, you know, put it between the towels, all that. I got it dry. And, but when it was finished, I felt like it felt a little stiff. And I put it in my, because it was not, number one, it wasn't historic. It wasn't, you know, Martha Washington's quilt or anything. And, um, it was one I had paid not very much for, but it's a great teaching quilt. And I threw it in the dryer for 20 minutes on fluff, mm -hmm. and it felt so much better. Yeah, I have friend. I have a really good friend who loves her um, clothesline outside. She used to call me and she'd say, "Oh, I just took my towels in from outside, and they feel so good." And I would say, "No, don't, Teresa. <laughs> they are." Yeah, they are scratchy. <laughs> Throw them in the dryer. You know, I I just think that that fluff you get from the dryer helps. <laughs> so no, you, you're good. You're good. But just I wouldn't put my palampore in the dryer. Well, that's another question. Yes, it's a totally Can you different thing. Palampore. I've never even heard that term. Okay, uh, this is a derivative of the word. Um, Indian bed covering. So it's Pashima, and they, it then was interpreted to be Palampore. In the 15, 1600s, we all studied about the east west, west trade route, but they were going to find uh, gold and spices and all these things. And in the process, they went to India and they found textiles. And they found cotton textiles. And up until then, in Europe, they were primarily doing silk, wool, linen. and linen. The linen was really not usually dyed. It was usually more natural. And the uh, silk and the wool was easier to dye because it is an animal protein fiber. Cellulosic fibers like cotton and linen were very difficult to dye. You might wash it and then it's done. It's just kind of faded and icky, so then you gotta dye it again. And so for some these Indians had figured it out. And they were so excited that they started bringing home these kind of bed coverings to their wives. And the wives fell in love with them and they called them chintz. Mm -hmm. And um, <coughs> so in fact it interfered so much with the Europe, with the English and the French market that about 1650 they outlawed them. Well, it's like anything else, you outlaw it and everybody wants it. <laughs> so uh, then it became, finally, I think around 1710, they said, you know what, we gotta worry, we gotta worry about something else. And by, but by then, by 1750s, uh, they were developing um, ways to manufacture and dye these cotton textiles, and that's when France started making the toile, mm -hmm. the beautiful French toile. And then it just evolved, and with the Industrial Revolution, it just went on and on and on. So yeah, I do lectures on that kind of stuff. And so it's just, um, I happen to, we, I think I can tell a story real quick. We've got a few minutes. Um, how I became interested in palampores, and it is kind of an unusual topic because there are not many of them. I was a member of the Quilt Guild in Newbern. I was just starting 
my um, process of going into textile conservation, but they were hanging their show and they asked me if I'd like to come and I was going to display some of my quilted textiles that I had clothing. And so I went in and these women were in a big old Crest building. Y'all remember Crest, Woolworths, you know, and McClellan's. So I went in at this big building, you know, with the big, big high tin roofs and the oiled wooden floors and these women were very carefully covering the floor in cotton sheets and hanging their new things. But I looked and over in the corner, you know, this ceiling is from really high, they had two husbands on a ladder nailing oh my this God. quilt to the wall. So I stood there and hyperventilated for a couple <laughs> minutes and, you know, didn't want to cause a scene, so I said, why are they doing that? <laughs> and they said, oh, we do that every year. They said, that's Harriet's old quilt, and it's big, and it covers up that hole where the, there's not a door, but that's where we go to the bathroom, and we just want that hole covered up. So here I have visions of these people going all weekend long, pushing that quilt back with their hands and walking and going to the bathroom. So I said, can you please find Harriet for me? <laughs> and so they found Harriet, and she was absolutely wonderful. Harriet and I became good friends. She was precious, she said. I said, Harriet, why are they doing that? She said, well, my dad had that. It was a big quilt in Philadelphia that my family had. They had a very big house, and they used to use it as a room divider. And she said, I just don't particularly like it. It's just a big old brown quilt. And so she said, um, but I told them they could do it. She said, well, I really like a crazy quilt. <laughs> And I said, well, would you be interested in selling this quilt? And she said, oh, yeah. She said, I'd love to get rid of it. <laughs> and I said, well, you know how much you want for it? And she said, I don't have a clue. And I said, well, I don't have a clue either. So I called my friend, Rabbit Goody, who had got me going on the, the, these textiles. And Rabbit is just extremely, extremely knowledgeable about things. And I called her and I said, Rabbit, you know that book you told me to buy? And it's... um. It's a very famous book from Florence Montgomery. I said, look on page, blah, 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 and I think I have found a palimpore. And she said, Lynn, you found an old hippie bedspread. <laughs> and I said, I really don't think so. I said, I think I have found a palimpore. And she said, um, well, she knew Will and my husband and I were in the antique business. She said, well, y'all have lost money before by buying something and finding out later it wasn't any good. She said, so don't insult the woman, you know, give her a decent price. So I said, okay. So I go and I offer Harriet this price and Harriet was tickled to death. She said, oh yes. So she sold me the quilt. And it has then now opened the doors to me for all sorts of things. Um, because not many museums have them. And I now have that one that I bought and then the one that we bought that belonged to Winston Churchill's great grand great great grandmother. And um, then I have others, so I do lectures on that as well. So it was just kind of it fits into the evolution of quilts. This is quilted. It's quilted in a clamshell pattern. Mm -hmm. But then they started cutting them out mm -hmm. and cutting out that tree of life and then doing this and they became a little bit different in their coloring. Uh, they were done in the Netherlands. The Netherlands never did outlaw the uh, importation of the cottons, and they ha I had the privilege of going to uh, the Netherlands and seeing their um, chintz, and they have phenomenal chintz outfits because they became they use chintz for their wedding clothes, their funeral clothes, and so they just have a phenomenal amount of antique chintz there in their museums. So that's in a nutshell with that. Did you have a question? Uh, so th this is one solid piece? And one, the, well, actually, this particular one is several pieces, but some of them is just one panel. Okay. And but this, this one is, is so big, this one is 11 feet wide and 9 wow. feet long. It has panels in it. I think that this was probably curtains or something. Mm -hmm. And they would do the panels. They got to the place they would do panels to do 
drapes, and they'd have bed, bed spreads. Uh, there was even, I've seen a picture of like the manor house in England, that the entire room was decorated in this look. And so that was definitely a status symbol. But you, you can go now to decorator shops. I do a, my presentation I do on Palomboards is to say, okay, look, this reminds you of decorator fabrics that you see now mm -hmm. in your local shops. Because, look, they've got flowers on the same, you know, branch that are fanciful flowers and or their flowers have nothing to do with each other. And that's because they were trying to draw for the European market and they didn't know what the European market's flowers looked like. And they were sending pictures to them and it was just a whole, you know, mix up there. So anyway, that's that's something I enjoy doing as well. So any more questions about cleaning and display? Yes. Uh -huh. I have a question. How, I'm, I don't understand. How did you use the tool? Because um, I have a very old quilt. Okay. And I want to know what to do with that tool in trying to okay. fix it as sure. I can. And, and that's, that's great to ask. Um, I end up going to the store. There is tool that you, I mean, some of the textile conservators uh, end up, and I have bought some, um, there's some tool or, yeah, they call it tool, that's made in England that's woven, and it's made out of silk, and you can dye it, and it's very, very expensive, it's $80 a yard. And then there's also stuff called crepe, um, crepeling with silk that can be dyed, then there's um, tea text that can be dyed. But for just regular quilts, most regular quilts, I think that the nylon tool you can get or the silk tool you can get uh, in most stores is good. Get the real soft. There's usually the real soft ones. Some are just stiff and kind of scratchy. Don't mm -hmm. do stiff and scratchy because that could abrade the fabric. But the good thing is, is you can get them in different colors. And so then you, you um, like I said, if you want to be real particular with it, with putting the vinyl over it and drawing out a pattern, or what a lot of times I'll do, say, we've got a hexagon. Whoops, trip and kill myself. Here's a better way of showing you. If you've got this hexagon here, and you want to put, this is a damaged piece, see here? And I would go in with a piece and I would applique another piece there. And I probably could find this pink because it's been reproduced. I know that. But there's another place that's not. But if it were just kind of slit and I thought I'll never find one to match that, then I would still I would take a piece of probably gray tool if I could find it. And if not, I'd do black. I'd see how black looks. And I would stitch it, big stitches, not tremendous stitches, but kind of big stitches that you're not going to be able to see well around there. And then I would take scissors and very carefully trim it around the edges. So is the tool basically to, to keep it... To hold it in place. And it stays in the quilt? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so then you're putting a piece of... So if I want to match, I mean, if I want to do that pattern... So then you're saying to put the vinyl on it to mark it to, to draw your pattern if you if decide. If I was going to replace if it. If you were going to piece. replace it, yeah. So the tool is just to hold it in place. To hold it in place. While you're thinking so of replacing it. Yeah, so it doesn't stretch and move and it doesn't get abraded more. And you keep the tool in there? Yeah, just keep it on there. And that's why I'm saying that's a good thing about get you can get colors, you can get different colors. Okay. And so you would um, not stitch on top of you just do the outside. Stitch. I just stitch around, but if it's kind of a big piece, yeah, I would probably do a cross okay. or something. And just do as much hidden as you can. And we didn't discuss threads. Uh, in most cases I you use cotton. One. Whoops. And and I whoa. Oh. <laughs> See, these are quilts. I can put it up. These are quilt squares that I've picked up at flea markets or whatever. And I buy a lot of these because if I had a customer come to me or I bought a quilt and they said, I've got this quilt, see it's pretty good shape, but I've got just those three or four fabrics that just went. Then I've got these 
that I can then use that fabric. So do you use old fabric or new fabric? Old fabric is good, it's better, if it's in good condition. But don't use, you know, ratty stuff, you know, that would, would be in, that if you pulled it, it would tear. Like you said, old fabric, like when you were talking about how you took the back of one that was an old, that wasn't working, so that's some old fabric that you could probably incorporate yes. into it. Yes, and it was in great shape. But if it had been, you know, not in great shape, then don't use it because you're just putting bad on bad. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, but, you know, I mean, look at this. This is crisp. This is a top that has never been washed, never quilted. And so that fabric is very crisp. And it, if there were just a few chunks of it, then I would definitely use that in something. And there's a big controversy right now. There, young girls love coats and things made out of quilts. Mm -hmm. They're cutting them up. Mm -hmm. There's recently been a big article in the New York Times. Mm -hmm. How do I stand on this? My personal opinion is if it is a really, really nice, good condition quilt, I kind of want to cry. <laughs> um, but if it's got like this one over here, if it had a few more pieces that weren't good, yeah, I'd consider it. Or I would consider making it smaller and making a baby quilt mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, so I think at times there are some quilts that, yes, you're kind of honoring the quilter by, you know, helping their quilt continue because if it were in really bad shape, say in one corner or whatever, then for it just to be folded up and put away, it's going to end up at the yard sale That's for five dollars. This old coat that I have, do I, do I use it in another way, or do I, do yeah. I try to fix this one that I have? And you just decide, you know, or had you rather just fold it and be able to just see the good parts? Right. right. So a lot of it's the history, but no, there there are two or three, you know, New Yorky type designers, and I contacted one of them a while back, and I said, uh, I. I'm concerned about this. And she said, oh, I only use cutter quilts that are in really bad, you know, repair. Well, number one, you're not going to make a coat you're going to sell for $800 out of a quilt that's ratty, you know, and, and in bad shape. Well, she probably did and got away with it. Yeah, but, you know, no, they're buying new, I mean, they're buying new condition mm -hmm. antique quilts. They're doing a lot of the 30s and 40s, these bright, bright colors okay. like this and they're making these, you know, coats. My biggest problem with it is they're going to go out of style, they're going to all end up at Goodwill, and, mm -hmm. or a rag bag, or whatever. But, you know, I can't be the quilt police either. I got a lot of other jobs. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I've wondered about that too, and, and you're probably the only person I've ever met that's really in the position of being able to answer this question. Okay. But aren't there just like, a ton of quilts nobody cares about anyway. Like nobody cares, nobody wants it in the family, and they just sort of get pushed to the side, sent to Goodwill, sent to a yard sale, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I do kind of wonder, like, and honestly, I How many quilts can you have? Right, and I go <laughs> online, and there's a lot of ugly quilts. Uh, yeah, there are. And that's sad too, but mm -hmm. what can you do? But anyway, I just wonder, like, am I right that there really are a ton of quilts nobody gives a rat's rump about? Uh -huh. Yeah, there are. And so that's why I said I can't be the quilt police because there are so many factors. Now, have I got time to tell about this one? Oh, tell about that one. Okay. You want to come help me hold it up? Oh, yes, sir. Okay. This is a quilt that Doug's audience, she said, would give a rat's rump about. Um. My husband said to me, this man is coming and he rides, he drives a motorcycle and he has one of those little carriers on the side and he's going to have it full of quilts and things. So you need to come over here at noon and he'll be here. <laughs> so I showed up at noon, man had already been. And so he, I said, did you buy anything? You know, you didn't call me. And he said, yeah, he said, but it was pretty bad. He said he had a whole bunch of crocheted afghans and he had about five other quilts that were not so hot. But I went ahead and bought them anyway, because he drove so far. So we waited there. And I said, um, oh, well, let me see them, let me see them. Well, I brought out the quilts, and they were in pretty bad shape. So <laughs> the, the crocheted afghans went immediately to the homeless shelter. 
And this one, though, intrigued me, because later after this, you can come up and see a lot of it. I don't care. Um, is it the prettiest quilt I've ever seen? None. But it, it feels silky, stretchy. And I, I thought, what is that fabric? It reminds me of something. So I just hung it up on the banister to my studios upstairs. So I hung it on the banister. And I would just go up and down and look at it and think, what is that? I just don't know. It's just so familiar. And it could have been two months later, I don't know, one day. You know how that, that light bulb in the comics strips, well, that was my light bulb. And I went, oh my gosh, it is, what do y'all think? No, look at that. What do y'all think it is? Look at these little humps here. There's two or three others. There's two up here, two up here. It's socks. Oh. Oh. Oh it is socks. Do any of y'all, did y'all have grandfathers who wore those silky socks that they had to wear the garters to hold them up? That is what these are. And this quilt came from the Burlington area. Greensboro area, and what were y'all famous for? Socks. You made a lot of socks. And this, I'm sure, was socks that were probably rim, you know, damaged. And a lot of people say, you know, Friday afternoon, they'd have this big bin, and the women could go get the shirt cutaways, the whatever, you know, the remnants that were no good that, from that week. And they would make quilts. This woman was at a sock factory, or her mother walked, or, you know, maybe it was a, a daughter who brought them to her mother, and her mother was tickled to death with whatever she bought, and she turned it into a quilt. You know, things like double knits, they did that. Um, but this, so historically, this is now a fabulous quilt. I mean, I would not heart with this quilt, unless I did put it in a really special place. They're going to keep it here to put on exhibit and probably have some ads from that time period showing them. And so that is, that's where I get excited. And I'm glad I'm able to identify some of this stuff so it isn't thrown in the trash. I, you just said something about double knits. I have a friend who passed away, and she has a trunk. I mean, one of those steamer trucks that's mm -hmm. when we were into the double knits and doing. Oh that. yeah. Did you make a quilt out of double knits? Well, I'll tell you, they are so heavy. That, that, yeah. But they also are very um, warm. Warm. The only thing is, they're a fire hazard. If your house caught on fire, they melt yes, on true. top of you. Yeah. But I have the most fun story. As you can tell, I got lots of stories. But there's an antique place in Swansboro, North Carolina. They had two quilts hanging on the side of their little building. One was cotton. It was falling apart. Double knit. It was perfect. <laughs> it had been up there in the direct sun <laughs> for ages. Well, it was an hour away from me. So one Saturday, I got my camera and drove over there so I could take a picture of it. Dag on it, they had taken it down. <laughs> I was so annoyed. So I don't know. Maybe I need to put one on the wall and just leave it there for a couple of years to let people see. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, but there's some people who actually collect double knit right. quilts. She's got, she's got a lot of double knits. Yes, yeah. Are they but made or just the fabric? No, there's just the fabric that yeah. she collected. She kept saying, I got to go in that trunk, I got to go in her son's going to go in. I thought, do I want to go in that trunk? I, I, I know. Or not. I know. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's a tough My mother in law is a double knit queen. <laughs> she made, she would cut up double knit pants and make quilts. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, they're, 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 some of them are kind of cool, but most of them are just. What do you do with them? Got it. And I can't offend my husband and say they're gone. So we'll see. Yes. Talking about the 50 states, do you ever deal with Hawaiian quilts? I have actually only one time I wet cleaned a an Hawaiian quilt. In fact, I almost put it in this this slideshow. It was beautiful, beautiful. And I have been to uh, Honolulu where the Bishop Museum is, and they have a phenomenal collection. 
And so I bought a quilt kit and made a one pillow block. Mm -hmm. in well, there. they always make you do one pillow, so you can build it. Yeah, yeah. So I, I did one, and I really love it, but I'm not going to make the whole quilt. Right. But, but a fabulous style. And there's so many opinions on was did that evolve from the applique quilts that were done in the Pennsylvania area. Well, and then the missionaries went there and took I this did, style. When I did the quilts, they always talked about the missionaries. The quilts, the quilts in the United States, the, the mainland, were done with the pieces less scraps mm -hmm. left mm -hmm. over. And the Hawaiians used one total piece, so that's why it's done. But like you shoulder. also see some of that in, that evolved in Pennsylvania from the Germans. So that's a whole nother thing too. Uh, so it's, they're fascinating, but they are just beautiful. I love them. So no, I have been very blessed to, to go to just some amazing quilt museums or just museums with fabulous quilt collections. So any other questions? Yes ma'am, do you ever see quilts that have squares that are cross stitch? Uh -huh. I took it upon myself to make one several years ago, and this lady offered me $500. Now, my 37-year-old daughter was standing there crying, going, Mama, please don't give me away. <laughs> and, but I was just wondering if you ever run across them, and are they really worth a lot? They are not worth a lot to most people. They're, a lot of them are kit quilts. Now, I actually did one that was sort of a kit quilt for my nephew when he was born, squares, and I did cross stitch all the Beatrix Potter mm -hmm. um, little mm -hmm. characters. But I'm sure it's not super valuable. That, uh, the quilt values have gone down tremendously. There are a few uh, certain styles that are really good, but a lot of the prices have gone down quite a bit because they have now come out of the attics, come out of the trunks, because a lot of the people who own them are now passing away and the families are getting them. So like you say, yeah, there are a lot. There are a lot out there. I was surprised, well, pleasantly surprised to hear you could put muslin wrapped with quilts in that rather than massive free paper. Yes. And what I, we didn't talk about folding, but if you were gonna fold a quilt, you can either uh, do acid-free paper and make little um, rolls. And I mean, that's what they do here because they, they've got a ton of acid-free paper. But I also have made um, like tubes with the muslin and stuffed it with polyfill. And when you're folding it, you put it here. Whoops. And you fold it over there. Yeah, I'm sorry, I keep jumping around with the camera <laughs> lady. So you just put it down and fold it so that you don't have those creases. So that's, if you've got one that's really special, that's a great idea to do that. So I mean, there are lots of things I haven't been able to tell you. Mary, have I left out anything that you go, oh my gosh, I wish you'd told her this. <laughs> square and then they folded they, they put stuffing in the center almost like cooking and <laughs> they folded in their corners to me folded in the other corners and then stitched it so and then they stitched all of those little fat stuffed blocks together and that's on exhibit now and it is in pretty rough shape every square yeah it's in rough shape but because of the technique, mm -hmm. it is a really interesting piece. Mm -hmm. 
So. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again. Oh, thank you. This is wonderful. Yeah, yeah.